Welcome to the Stuff That Matters Now podcast resource. This is a short excerpt clipped out of episode 16 with my interview with Business Genetics founder Ian McDougall and where he had done some wonderful research interviewing 30 up-and-coming uh, Gen Z future executives uh, who are interns in major companies and digging into what they saw were the major eight characteristics uh, that were needed to lead in the new world. Uh, these are based around the soft skills. So it was around agility, ambiguity, emotional intelligence, failing, flexibility, uh, forging trusted relationships, uh, integrity and judgment. Now, Ian didn't know what these were going to do before he set out, but this is what he came up with. It's a wonderful resource. We've cut it out so it's more accessible. Feel free to use it. Feel free to share it. It is relatable to any generation, uh, mine included. What are the key things that are going to set people apart to manage and lead? Going forward, yes, yep. Uh, with this and and with this particular generation, uh, and I mean the listeners can uh, can uh, sort this out for themselves. But I think that it is what you've done is not uh, 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 just for this generation because I think it it crosses over most most of the generations if not all of them yeah it's intergenerational yeah it is it is so you've taken this the snapshot okay right so i talked to um slightly more than 30 people and the conversations lasted for one hour yeah actually in some cases they went to almost two hours um i completed all this last year uh, the sample was Generation Z, people that we'd consider future executives. Um, a number of them were interns in major companies or were in early management or had been promised management positions in 18 months. So quite a select group who actually knew what they were talking about. And so we started talking. And they were happy to be interviewed? Uh, they were delighted to be interviewed. Yep. And they were very articulate. Yep. And very considered. They did not know the questions that I would be asking them before the interview. And that's very important. Um, I'll go into it in, in 10 seconds, but I wanted to say first up that the there was a very high level of consensus. So I'm talking to 30, 32 different people on every question there was a lot of commonality. Okay. And that gives you a very high level of confidence in the accuracy of the data. Yep. So what emerged was uh, one, two, three, eight factors. Okay, so what we're going to go through now is Ian's looking at a piece of paper with the results of the, of the, uh, of the research – and you've got eight different factors that you have identified that are going to be critical for them, basically to set themselves apart. Correct. Yeah, going forward. Correct. So we're just going to start in alphabetical order and go through them, yeah? We are. Cool. Go. So um, bear in mind, too, that these words are not my words or halves. These are the words from the people we interviewed, the Generation Z men and women who are going to be managing – companies or social organizations in in the future. Um, I'm going to give you the eight, and then I'm going to quickly go back and, and talk about what each one means. So the factors that emerged, and remember what this is called is in quotes, quote, soft, sk soft skills for the new world, unquote. That was the subject of the brief. So the skills are... Agility, ambiguity, emotional intelligence, failing, flexibility, forming trusted, enduring relationships. There's that one again. Uh, integrity, 
and the last one, judgment. Um, So, backing up, agility, what does agility mean? So, my my questions were designed... Just just before, did you know you were going to end up with eight? You would have... No. no, Okay, so the eight that came out, that was just what fell out of the research. Correct. Cool, okay. Um, So, I, I, I thought actually that I might get four or five. Right, okay. Because uh, it's a long list. It's a long list, but it's an important list, and the and and it's important for one reason. Uh, so I'm I'm glad you stopped me there. Um, it's important because each of these relate to each other. They are not separate standalone yep. issues. Yep. So the managers of tomorrow are expected to show an overlay between each of these yep. characteristics. Yep. Obviously, they'll have some strengths in some areas perhaps weaknesses and others, but they have to have a blend or an amalgam of them all. So um, the first one I mentioned was agility, and what agility means in this context is dexterity. Um, The ability to shift from one state to another, uh, the ability to recognize market social or political changes that are of importance to a commercial organization or to a social organization. And agility is also about responsiveness to be able to impact these shifts very rapidly. Right. So it is about the ability to say we've detected a change in the market, we need to be agile and address that change by doing X, Y, Z. Yep. Often referred to as nimbleness. Yep. Agile. Because you see it in responsive. companies when they cannot do it. Oh, you see it in companies when they can't do it immediately. Yeah. Um. The, the the companies I've interviewed completely separate of this issue, uh, and I'm thinking now of a couple in Wellington and a couple in Auckland who have about five or six people working for them. They would be in a late stage of start-up. Their degree of agility is absolutely phenomenal. Yep. So they can take on the big companies, the big slow corporate dinosaurs, and they can beat them unbelievably fast and at lower cost and with a higher level right. of service, simply through agility. Yeah. But most importantly, being connected to the market to detect what the consumer changes are before they become apparent. Yep. So the managers are going to have to be able to lead teams to, you know, because that's going to be the difficult thing, right? So an individual can be agile, but to lead, to have a team that's agile is going to develop, you're going to need a whole lot of skill to be able to do that. Correct. So when that manager is hiring people for the team, agility will be a core right. characteristic. Okay. Yep. Uh, but I think my point, Harv, is that if the manager has a high level of agility, almost by osmosis, they will attract people of yep. the same yep. ilk. Yep. But, on a, you know, today's world shifts so quickly, you know, digital internet, all of that yep. very obvious stuff changes the world from day to day. Look at politics, for example. Yeah, I think one of the important things with agility, though, Ian, is not to get it mixed up with um, uh, 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 sort of chaos. So there's a big difference between agility and chaos because I think some people think agility sort of looks chaotic, but agility is not chaotic. It's 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 fluid and it is a it is a it can be a very graceful shift. Correct. But it can happen very quickly. So, yes. yeah, it can't get too confusing. No. Uh, I mean, the issue of chaos comes into the very next point. So <clears throat> the one that we just addressed was agility. The next one is ambiguity, yep. which overlays nicely with this idea of of, of chaos. Uh, and, and I'm certainly not going to go into um, chaos theory, but ambiguity here means the ability – to manage ambiguity, to accept that it will be part of your personal and professional life and to handle it in a professional and 
analytical sense. And, and, and the best definition of ambiguity came from uh, a, a, uh, a female manager who I think will, will just, just be absolutely incredible in the, in the future in either a social organization or a commercial organization. And I asked her to define ambiguity, and she said, ambiguity is the capacity to manage it, ambiguity, in business or social relationships or situations while avoiding paralysis. Right. So that's the last bit is the most important, right? Correct. So those last words, while avoiding paralysis, is um, usually the outcome from chaos or situations of great ambiguity, is that we don't know what we're dealing with, we're not quite sure how to approach it, we have conflicting pieces of information, we become paralysed. And I see this in companies, huge and small, all the time. So you need to, you need to break down, analyse why things appear to be ambiguous, take them to their root cause... And then become agile in developing solutions. New solution. And and that's actually all that ca- – chaos is often considered to be a good thing. Personally, I have a view that's completely the opposite because I think that chaos produces a bunch of people who become responsive only Mm -hmm. to situations and never become strategic. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ability to handle ambiguity is totally about getting to strategic, coherent uh, solutions from what appears to be chaotic or or ambiguous. I hope that's not too abstract. No, no, it's not. It's it's because it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's amazing how those two are so overlapped. Totally overlapped. Yeah. And, you know, I know there are times I've become paralysed and it's just horrible. You're just like a stunned mullet going, fuck, what am I supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and you just haven't actually got to the root cause of what is going on. Absolutely. (coughs) Look, there's – I I, I just wanted to give give a verbatim – it's a quote actually from a guy called Bertrand Russell who was an English mathematician turned philosopher. And he said that he turned to philosophy because it allowed him to live in a world of ambiguity without being paralyzed by mm. hesitation. Mm. It's a fantastic quote. And it's about uh, oh, 80 or 90 years old, I suppose. I might mm. have that wrong. He's been dead for a while. Controversial figure. But that's exactly what we're talking about because chaos and ambiguity leads to paralysis, which means you don't do anything. Yep. And not doing anything in the 21st century is instant um, death, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this next one, emotional intelligence. Yeah, well, this one gets bandied about a lot. And um, to be frank, I'm tired of sick sitting in huge meetings with major corporates where usually the most senior male in the room talks about being highly emotional intelligent and they've got the emotional intelligence you know of a battle tank really <laughs> it's um it's something that came out uh, in the in the research as being incredibly important and what emotional intelligence means is around empathy um, and the understanding of another person that transcends rational or commercial requirements. Uh, let me explain that for a moment. Um, you're, you're in a conversation with someone you haven't met before or you're in a conversation with someone that you've known all your life. You will have in your head a desired outcome for that conversation. But what that person is actually looking for is your understanding of them that goes way beyond a commercial outcome or a societal outcome. And essentially what that second party is saying is, um, treat me as a human being, treat me as a person, love me, like me, understanding, understand me, uh, but even if you hate me, accept me. 
And I think that that kind of stretch is exactly the sort of emotional intelligence required in the future. And where it's going to become really, really important is you would have detected a shift in um, uh, the way that companies manage themselves from the older male style of command and control. Here's the strategy, do this, do that. Have you done it? How well have you done it? To a management system based around collegiality uh, and collaboration. And when you live in a company driven by collegiality and collaboration, you have to have a high level of emotional intelligence. And interestingly, emotional intelligence is one of the great, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, is one of the great factors that allows you to handle ambiguity. Mm, mm. So you see, you start to see how these various apparently disparate points actually work together. Mm. Look, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting that I see uh, the world changing from uh, transactions to connections mm. that let's get a connection first before we do any transaction. If the connection is not right and it doesn't feel right and our values don't lie, there's no point entering the next stage of transaction. No, you're absolutely right. I, I would have used a slightly different term. I would have said we're in a world moving uh, from transactions to relationships. Yep. That's the only difference. Yep. Um, have. And if you accept that um, every piece of commercial or societal endeavor is a relationship – then it automatically follows that you must have a high level of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that relationship will self-destruct. Mm -hmm. yep. Because the element of collaboration, collegiality is missing. Yeah. Look, you know, it's, 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 uh, I've got a thing on, on my office that says get, get interested in other people's reality. And I've got that next to my desk. And I've got that because I forget to do that. Mm. Right when I mm. when I get triggered by something or I'm tired, I think, look, just sort out my problem or whatever, or just or go away. You know, that's my the worst um, space I get in, and I just lose all patience and mm. so forth. Right, and it's just like, oh fuck this, it's just all too hard. Mm. Um, and and it's there to remind me get interested in their perspective because they've got a perspective and it's real, and. Things go a lot better when I get interested in their perspective. Absolutely, you know. <laughs> but it's not sometimes. It's not very easy to do. Yeah. So we've covered agility, ambiguity, and emotional intelligence. The one I want to get onto now is um, about failing. And this uh, this this is just fantastic. What <clears throat> failing means is being allowed to fail and having the capability to handle your own failure but to learn from it by understanding the causality of the failing and to form principles for future behaviours around that. Now, a very good example is the Honda motor company out of Japan. So Honda was started by... Sokiro Honda himself and his simple ideology was we are going to build cars that will rate with any other manufacturing company in the world and we're going to get there by failing which means that all of the people in my design teams the bolt cutters the people that assemble the people that spray the paint the people that build the engines will be allowed to fail provided they learn how to do it better. There you go. That's the key there, isn't it? Correct. Provided you learn to do it better. Yeah. And so, you know, it touches on this very powerful notion that experience in its own right is not material. What is material is when you convert experience, in this case failures, into learnings into principles, into laws that will stop you failing again in that particular area in the future. Um, but the, the, greatest, the greatest inventions of all time have come from continual failure, and I, I won't bore you to death with the Edison analogy, the light bulb thing. 
but it's actually still a pretty good yep. example of why it's important to yeah, fail. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Look, I think that um, you know, uh, and it's interesting. I don't like the. Oh, no, oh, no. Sorry, I'll, I'll change that. I didn't used to like the word failing, but I've learnt to. I, I'm a lot happier with the word failing now mm. uh, as I get older because I understand how important it is. Mm. Where before it just sucked. Mm. You know, it was just like there was no upside to failing. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which, interesting, ties into the emotional intelligence because when you've failed is then to be able to keep yourself together and go, what actually happened then? Mm. Rather than just sulking. Mm. Yeah. Because when you understand what happened then, it becomes a principle that you can adopt yep. going forward and it then it then presents failure in a different light. It wasn't actually a failure. It was simply part of the learning process. Yep. Yep. So it's quite a different thing. It goes yep. from negative to positive. Yep. I wanted to talk about flexibility. So this is the one, two, three, four. This is the fifth learning from the research. Um, on the surface, flexibility seems to be pretty obvious. Um, it's, a, it's around the whole idea of tractability in people. Uh, and and it's about having working relationships. Uh, working relationships, I don't necessarily mean in a commercial sense. It might be a working relationship with your wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Societal relationships with different people, relationships of any kind. Um, they have to be tract tractable. And that means that we must avoid rigidity in thinking and behavior. And I have seen over my career, regardless of what country I've been working in, I've seen products or commercial failures often occur through rigidity in thinking or behavior. This is the way that we've done it. This is the way we must continue to do it. This is the policy of the company. It's that kind of rigidity that's the, that's the way opposite. We, that's the way we do it here. That's the way we do it here. That's yeah. right. And so that 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 issue around flexibility impressed me enormously when I I can remember when I was doing the collective intelligence interviews, which now go back a couple of years, possibly even longer, is that the people I was interviewing had a very very high level of flexibility. So they would state a position on something, but you could then talk about the position that they had taken, they would, they would accept and absorb that information and then form a different position. So they were constantly moving based on new incoming information. That's the kind of flexibility I'm talking about, as opposed to the kind that says, uh-uh, no, 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 don't even want to talk about that. Yep. Because that is opposed to the way I've been taught yep. to do it. Ian, look, this is uh, – I had a fascinating conversation last night around politics and I was with some people who are, um, are very attuned to one particular party. Yeah. And I said, have you ever voted for another party? No, we've always voted this party. I said, oh, that's interesting. And so even if your party was not any good, you'd still vote for them? Yes. I went, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And and they said, well, what, who do you vote for? I said, well, I vote. I, I line up at the, at the, at the election and go... I have no idea who I'm going to vote for because I actually want to listen to them and form my opinion as we go forward. And it was fascinating to see just how rigid they were. And I know when you're rigid, you only hear certain stuff. You know, your side's good, their side's bad. Mm. End of story. And it's just not true. I don't believe anyway. No, it's not true. It's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to... And so um, the difference between flexibility and agility? Um, flexibility is about avoidance of rigidity. Agility is the ability to shift from one state to another. It tends to be bigger and it tends to be based on speed of responsiveness. Yep, okay. And the, these but two, they are quite close, actually. But these two will be tied together, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so all of these things so far are tied together. They overlay. Yep. Correct. Cool. Which, which is why I said earlier you have to look for a candidate that's got all of these characteristics. Right. Okay. Number six. 
Right. Well, actually, what I want to do is I want to jump one to – I want to talk about integrity, okay. and then I'll come back to the last two characteristics, cool. which are highly distinguishing characteristics. Cool. So integrity, um, wow, gets battered about all the time. Um, and yet integrity cannot be claimed by an individual. It is only conferred on an individual. So integrity is like this word trust. You can never, never, ever say I'm a trustworthy person. Trust is imposed upon you or not by second parties. You earn it. You earn trust. You behave in a way that shows you to be trustworthy at all times, and those people have integrity. And I, I, I was trying to get from my respondent interviewers what integrity really meant. And I put together an amalgam of different views which came out like this, that integrity is consistent observed behavior founded on honesty, transparency, and delivery. And I think the key words there are that however you're behaving is clearly observable. It is based on the idea of consistency that you behave in a particular way all the time so that you become, I suppose, reliable is a crude word to put on that. But you exhibit characteristics of honesty and transparency, and you always deliver something, an action, idea, a product, a service, a point of view, when you say you will do mm. it. Mm. Uh, now, I mean, when, I, when, I, when those words come out of my m mouth, heart, I go, well, it's seems so obvious and almost, almost seems a bit cheesy. But in fact, it took a lot of interviews to get to that point. Mm. And that, in fact, is how the market is, Generation Z market is defining integrity. So, the, the, Ian, the interesting thing there is the transparency, right, which is hugely important. And when we talk about these other ones, okay, of failing and flexibility and ambiguity, right, Things aren't black and white anymore. So being trustworthy and, and having integrity when things are predictable and so forth, right, that's that's a whole different skill than being having integrity and transparency when things are fluid. Mm. I think those are a vastly different type of integrity. Mm. And I think the integrity going forward is going to be – it's going to take more to master mm. going forward. Because we trust black and white, okay, we've delivered that. Where going forward, we won't even know what they need to um, deliver sometimes, right? Because it's going to be not so clear. True. So I think this, I think the integrity thing is even more complex than it's been in the past. Yes, I think it has. And I think transparency is going to be, uh, yeah, is a key part of that. Well, I think transparency wraps up all of the things we've been talking about. If you're transparent, then you will be consistent. You will behave in a uh, a responsible way. You will exhibit pieces of behaviour that are welcomed and respected, even if the other person doesn't particularly want to hear that point of view at that yep. time. Yep. So then, so those are the first six, and you've left the last two as the, these are the two crunchy critical ones. Correct. So, here's where we get to it. So I've Jim, been pretty happy so far, Ian, with, with Okay, fine. Oh, <laughs> no, but, as in, I mean, the first six, you go, yeah, that's, that's a hell of a list. Uh, well, well, it it is a hell of a list. It's a hell of a list too. If you put yourself in the practical position of interviewing Generation Z um, candidates for a particularly important management job that might be coming up in eighteen months, yeah, yeah. say, um, you're going to be working pretty hard to find a person who exhibits high on each of these <laughs> factors. But in fact, they do exist, yeah. and I know that because the majority of the respondents, thirty odd, all met. Right, those those requirements to right. varying degrees. Right. 
so so the the issue here is if if we end up with a whole room full of Generation Z candidates, what are the two important factors that will distinguish the candidate I want for my job? And the two are, we touched on it before, forming trusted, enduring relationships. That is the ability to form trusted and enduring relationships with other people. And the second one is judgment. So... Given that we've already broken ground on the enduring relationship thing, I'll talk about that one first. Um, what it means is that it signifies a completely dependable relationship that you can build beyond the normal state of expected behaviors. Um I may be in a commercial relationship with a second party. I may be in a social relationship with a second party. I have expectations of how they will behave, how they'll talk to me, how they'll address me, that they'll follow through on things, they'll stay in touch, I'll be a human being. But enduring relationships are built on something that goes beyond that. And... A lot of the conversations that have built enduring relationships in my time have started off with the words, yes, but have you thought about this? Where you have introduced a completely different idea into a second person's world that they may in fact be uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. They may in fact oppose it. But... And somewhere in that opposition, there is this factor that the second person says, you know, that guy, in this case Ian, didn't have to say that, probably knew it might upset me, but he said it anyway because I think he thinks that it will make me a better person or a more informed person. And there's an element of that transparency that we talked about before. But there's very much a sense of... of um, of rigorous honesty here. But time and time again, people can connect over a lifetime and they will never have a trusted and enduring yeah. relationship. Yeah. And yet, I don't know, I suppose I've been quite fortunate um, and I've always understood the importance of respect here, but I can usually develop a relationship that is trusted and enduring quite quickly and it's all based around honesty transparency delivery so why does it endure why does it endure because the second party believes that when everyone else is telling them rubbish or telling them what they want to hear that this is a person who will tell them the truth the biggest problem that chief executives have today in my view and they will admit this I think um, is that they're too protected. They're too protected from the realities of the business and the yeah. market. And the reason for that is they have around them a whole lot of people who are essentially sycophantic, tell them what they want to hear. So an enduring relationship is one where you go, this person is my working colleague or my friend, and sometimes I hate them because they tell me the truth. Yeah. But I know that this is one person in my lifetime that will tell me what I have to be told. Yeah. It's a very, very important characteristic and it lies it lies at the very heart of the ability to form a trusted enduring relationship. So Ian, do you and I have a, a trusted enduring relationship? Yes, I believe we do. Mm. Um and the reason for that, which which is germane to the conversation, is that um when I reported back to you the results from your members, the interview respondents, you accepted them with a lot of questions. And some of them, I think, were quite painful. But you heard them and you adjusted the business and you adjusted your own mental state to it. So that was an important part of that mm. relationship building. So I'd say categorically, yes, we do have. Mm. Yes, we do. Mm. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, and it's 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 you know it sounds such a simple thing to do, Ian, doesn't it? It sounds such a simple thing to do, but it takes uh, it's bloody uncomfortable sometimes. Mm. Uh, and you know, one of the wonderful, fortunate things for me is I'm surrounded by uh, a team of facilitators who tell me shit whether I like it or not. Mm. And uh, you pick up great information, and it makes our bond stronger mm. as a result. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that uncomfortable bit. Yeah. So this is this is the, this is the this is one of the critical things you've pointed out. It's one of the two. The other one. Shall I go into that? No, now? just let's be, okay. before we <clears throat> wrap up on that one. So to be clear, this is a key element needed for Generation Z going forward, for them to be able to develop those relationships yes so come back come back to my earlier analogy i'm sitting in a room with four different candidates for a very important job that's going to kick in in 18 months time they all have essentially the same knowledge they have the same educational level roughly yep Yep. they're kind of the same people they're frames of reference seller and of course they're all generation z yep what I'm looking for now, uh, what, what, what are the one or two or more elements that will say this person is probably better than the others? And this is one yep. of those two characteristics. So, you know, we haven't got time for it today, but how the hell do you, how the hell do you interview to find that out? Uh, well, the, the obvious way is to get them to give you, an exa- give you examples okay. and then contact that exemplary person as a referee. Okay. Okay, so the reference check becomes even more. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so that's that's one of the critical of the eight. And then the last one is judgment. Um, I've not yet, a, I've never yet met a person, a client, a friend, an interview respondent who has admitted to having poor judgment. <laughs> and yet most people do. <laughs> I do on some subjects. I'm not saying anything. (laughs) I, you know, the question I get asked about this one is, is judgment learned or innate? And I think the psychiatrists among us are going to hate this, but I think it's innate. I think that experience uh, and, and, you know, knocking about the real world teaches you things about judgment, but I think essentially judgment is highly intuitive. And there are degrees of intuition, and most intuition is based on learned facts anyway, particularly if you prescribe, if you subscribe to, say, to Malcolm Gladwell, who talked about it in his book, uh, I think it was called Blink. Blink, yeah. Um, but my, my, my experience is in, in the, the people, let me say it this way, the clients I have met in my career who exib- exhibited the finest, most magnificent pieces of judgment that I have ever seen, I believe it was largely intuitive. Mm. So what it means, however, to make this less abstract, what judgment means, and again, this is this, the, these words belong to the interview respondents, is the ability co- to convert experience into principles that guide sound counsel in matters of complexity or lack of precedent. So it's a bit it's a bit wordy and a bit yeah, high Yeah, do that again because right. sure, you lost me there. So I have um, – we're talking about judgment and I'm talking about the ability to take a whole lot of intuitive or real-life experience and say what that means in terms of a law or a principle is this and we'll call this X. We'll give it the power – of X, and and therefore I can use X as a guiding rule or bedrock when I'm making a decision in completely unknown territory. Because because right. the hardest decisions are they what I call the forty nine fifty one decisions. So if as a manager you are asked to ask you are asked to make a a decision that's a 90-10 decision, it's very easy and very safe. If it's 60-40, it's, it's okay. You can do that. But if it's 49-51, and essentially that's what you get paid for as a CEO to make the hard ones, 
it's it's not so easy. And so what you do is you rely on that sense of intuition, the Malcolm Gladwell thing, but you also try to put together uh, everything that you've learnt stripped back to the most simple of ideas or concepts. And out of that will come generally a clear view on what judgment you should make. But I, I have seen, I have seen um, CEOs make incredibly important decisions, literally in the blink of an eye, and they have proven to be magnificently correct over a long, long period of time. And I'm just looking at the list here, Ian, and going back to failing and or EQ and ambiguity and agility, mm. flexibility, and te- those are all tied up. The overlap is phenomenal. Well, the, the reason that judgment comes at the end of the exposition of the eight factors, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, is that judgment requires all of those things working together. Yeah. And it becomes an amalgam, it becomes a melting pot. And that's where a lot of intuition comes from. It is simply a collection of a whole lot of stuff at which you failed. And that's why that one aspect of failure is so important. So then how, when you are selecting a team, do you identify this trait? Oh, I like this. He's all quiet. Well, I was in in the context of this exercise, this piece of research. I was asked to sit in on an interview with a candidate, mm-hmm. and my client asked me that question, which kind of was rephrased like, <clears throat> "Ian, if you're so smart about this stuff, come and help me pick the right yep. person." In fact, there were two people: one was male, one was female. And the honest answer is, Harv, the only way that I could do that was to bring in a psychiatrist. um, It was actually a clinical psychologist who sat in on the interviews and did a lot of the hard yards trying to understand what the background was to each individual in terms of their judgmental abilities. So their work ranged from um, what do you believe about this issue, and this issue was a societal issue, for Mm -hmm. example, like global warming, for example. It's got nothing to do with the job, but it's got a lot to do with judgments that they can make. All the way through to give me examples, please, of (coughs) difficult judgment situations, 4951 situations, where you made a decision and tell me how you applied judgment to that. And then you would check out the veracity of that because you're at, the, you're at the hard bit of the interview, you're at the sharp end of it, when candidates who desperately want a job are going to lie. So you need to make sure that they're not. And Ian, that, that question, I'm just sitting there going, oh, I'm so pleased I'm not asked that question because that's just, that's a, that's a cocker. Mm. I'd lie. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd be sitting there going, what? No, oh, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it's a killer. It's a killer. But you see, let, let's just remind ourselves that this is not the employers or the companies or the social organizations talking about judgment. This is the people themselves, the Generation Z young men and women who are going to be handling these yeah. jobs that are saying, we think judgment is one of those two critical factors yeah, that will yeah. distinguish us. Yeah, yeah good reminder for a high-level management job in the future. Yeah. yeah, But it's a tricky one. So I've just been reflecting on that, Andy, because you have been asking young people, right? In, in my generation would have just asked the old people, right, because mm. they know. Mm. Right? This is flipping it completely around and asking the young people, what is it? Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating because I watch people of my generation struggle because when I was a young person... All we had to do is just copy what had been before us, mm. right? And you copy that. The person that copies that the best fits in well. Mm. The world's totally different to that now. Yes, it is. You know, these kids, oh, I shouldn't 
Shall I, call, I call them kids. I mean, they're not looking to follow us. They're looking to totally... No, they're breaking new ground. Yeah, breaking new ground. They... Um, I, I I mean, I'm... I'm kind of way older now, and I have enormous respect and regard for young people, and in this context, particularly for Generation Z, because they know what they don't know. Mm. And my whole career has been dealing with clients who often believe they know what they know and they don't, and the consequences of that can be quite catastrophic. So Generation Z will say, well, here's what I know because I learned it in university and I learned it as a principle that I established when I had this particular experience in my first job, my second job, whatever. But but the question you're posing now, I don't know the answer to that, mm. but I think I know how I might be able to mm. find the answer. And I think that particularly relates to areas like judgment, which are abstract. And yet, and yet I, I, I was just looking back on some cover notes that I had done on this very subject, that that judgment is is heavily based on knowledge and on experience, but also on that crazy thing called intuition. Mm. And I know that if I can just come back to Malcolm Gladwell for a moment, he he gives a number of examples, and I won't I won't bore the listeners with us now. But he gives a number of examples where people made instinctive, half second judgments that were questioned by their peers, but turned out after the event to be absolutely right. And yet, sometimes the rationality argued against them. So I'm kind of big on intuition, but then I have quite a few years of of history and learning and principles and experience and knowledge that I think goes into that vault, that magic vault yep. that we call yep. intuition, and that helps judgment. Yep. Ian, I just – look, I'm, I'm mindful of time, and, and uh, this is this has uh, been a long interview because it's been fascinating, and uh, we are going to have to wrap up soon. The, the interesting thing with us, and it's a personal theory that I believe that leadership has – been and gone. I think that leadership is archaic, uh, and I don't like the word anyway. Uh, and uh, I have a lot more faith in teams working together to solve stuff than having a leader. Uh, and you know, so many of the fuck ups of the world have been caused since World War Two with more leadership training than the world's ever seen and we've spent billions of dollars on it and a lot of that leadership has caused the problems that we're facing now. That's a personal view. Um, but I look at this list you've got here and I think of a team of people with these attributes, what they could achieve would be would be stunning. <clears throat> this is um you know, this is this is very, very um hot, I think, and very significant because if you can put as you say, a team of people that have these characteristics together, you will be unbeatable. Yeah, uh, and I mean un- unbeatable, not in that old competitive yeah, yeah, sense, but in the right sense. I mean, the only, the only the final comment I'd make about leadership—it's um, a completely obsolete concept now. It's been placed, in my view, by effectiveness. Collective intelligence is very good at producing effective people. Um, But effectiveness requires um, team integration. So a natural and obligatory part of effectiveness is the ability to work in a team. And how you work in a team in the future, in my view, comes back to the eight factors that we've just been talking about. End of story. Yeah. Do check out our Stuff That Matters Now podcast series on your favourite podcast provider or visit our website www.collectiveintelligence.co.nz to get links to new episodes. Contact us if you want to learn more about how we can help you evolve yourself and others. Thanks for listening.